All right, I think, are we, uh, you guys can hear me okay? We're, we're, we're good to go. Well, first, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, you know, this is, I, I think, I don't know for how many of you, but for me, this is the first event back where there's actually people filling a room like this. This is like a, a, a momentous day. Um, yeah, my name's Tony Lemieux. I am uh, here uh, as the founding co-director of the Atlanta Global Studies Center. Um, in, in collaboration with my colleagues Ryan Carlin and Leslie Marsh and Wolfgang Schlor um, from Georgia State, uh, our respective centers for human rights and democracy for Latina, uh, Latin American Latino studies um, in the Office of International Initiatives. We are here to engage in a dialogue with Ambassador Nestor Forster um, talking about the U.S.-Brazil relationship and really kind of having a, a wide-ranging discussion um, it is one of those things where as we have opportunities to really take advantage of Atlanta's placement as a truly global city um, and to have these kind of dialogues and to engage um, across different regions, across different disciplines, um, you know, we take uh, every opportunity to do that. So it's great to be here today. We're also joined, and I'm going to introduce um, Vanessa Ibarra from uh, the, the city of Atlanta. Um, and Wolfgang Schlor is going to introduce the ambassador. So we'll have a, a, a little bit of an introduction. The uh, ambassador will give a presentation and some remarks, and then we'll follow that with a question and answer, um, moderated question and answer session. So there'll be a couple of moments in between uh, the ambassador's uh, presentation and our session as we get some chairs uh, and everything situated on the stage. Um, but we are really looking forward to this conversation today. And Ambassador Forster, thank you so much for being here as well. So let me start by introducing Vanessa Ibarra. She's a graduate of Georgia State University's Master's Program of International Business and is the director of the City of Atlanta's Mayor's Office of International Affairs. Um, very recently, she was bestowed the French National Order of Merit um, with a rank of knight. So congratulations on that. It's a really uh, great accomplishment and recognition. Um, Vanessa's fluent in French, Spanish, English, and basic German. Um, and is a member of the Atlanta Global Studies Center Executive Board of Advisors. So we, we get to really uh, work with and benefit from Vanessa's expertise regularly and tremendously appreciate that. She works tirelessly to broaden Atlanta's reputation as a global city. And so um, with that, let me um, bring up Vanessa for some opening remarks. Good afternoon. Boa tarde. Again, please. Boa tarde. I'm, pra I'm practicing. We're going to learn some Portuguese, because as the Consul General said, not everybody's perfect unless you speak Portuguese. So my name is Vanessa Ibarra, and I'm the director for the Mayor's Office of International Affairs for the City of Atlanta. And on behalf of our mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, it is a pleasure to welcome you all here today. It is also great to come together, as I was telling everybody here. Uh, it's one of the first events that I've done in person back at Georgia State University. So it's great to sense a certain level of normalcy. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you, Ambassador Nestor Forster, and thank you, Consul General Carlos Abreu Silva, for everything that you do. And I also, I do not see her here, but I do want to recognize her, the president of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce, Lucia Jennings. She has been instrumental in furthering and strengthening ties with our sister city. And without her, we wouldn't be able to do everything that we do around trade. I'd also like to thank Dr. Wolfgang Schler, Tony Lemieux, again, Shep Nem, Oscar and Diana Renrab for hosting us today and for leading the charge for promotion of global education, which is one of the pillars of our office and the city of Atlanta. As one of the most diverse and welcoming cities in the United States, the city of Atlanta is fortunate and proud to have over 75,000 Brazilian nationals who call Atlanta home and contribute to the economic growth and the diversity of our region. As the cradle of the civil rights movement, we encourage inclusion, we value diversity, and take great pride in being a welcoming city. It goes without saying that the bonds of friendship and collaboration between Atlanta and Brazil are stronger because of our people-to-people -people connections. A relationship that began nearly 50 years ago with the establishment of the Atlanta-Rio sister city relationship we have become a family. In Brazil and Atlanta enjoy a rich history of cooperation, 
and we've had the opportunity to collaborate in many different areas, whether it be culture, education, commerce, sports. Recently, the Deputy Director of Communications met with Brazilian journalists to exchange best practices around media, misinformation, and communication with residents. And we've engaged in multiple trade missions to Rio, Sao Paulo, and even had the opportunity of welcoming a Brazilian soccer team, Flamengo. As you can see, our professional connections, our sisterhood, our family is strong. And there's many opportunities that remain to be explored in a lot of areas that we can collaborate on. Muito obrigada, thank you, and I wish you all a wonderful event. Welcome again. Oh, and with that, GSU is an important part of Atlanta's global landscape, and the Office of International Initiatives at GSU offers exciting opportunities for students to study abroad and to participate in virtual exchanges with peers in other countries. Because of these innovative programs, students gain international perspectives and the skills to work in diverse, globally connected workplaces. And with that, now I have the pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Wolfgang Schler, Associate Provost of International Initiatives at GSU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa, and uh, good afternoon. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Nestor Forster, Jr., Ambassador of Brazil to the United States. Ambassador Forster uh, was born in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and graduated from the Brazilian Diplomatic Academy in 1986. As a diplomat, he served in Canada, Costa Rica, and the United States, where he was actually posted three times to the embassy in Washington as well as to the Brazilian consulates in Hartford, Connecticut, and New York. His di diplomatic experience includes trade negotiations, intellectual property, financial policy, political affairs, international law, consular affairs, administration, and information technology. After he started his diplomatic career, Ambassador Forster was posted twice to the office of the President of Brazil, and also served as Chief of Staff at the Office of Attorney General. Most recently, he was head of the Foreign Ministry's Information Technology Division. Ambassador Foster has led numerous Brazilian delegations to regional and multilateral meetings. In 2006, he successfully concluded his high studies dissertation on development finance at the Rio Branco Diplomatic Academy. He also co-authored the official style guide of Brazil's federal administration, which has been in use for almost 30 years, and participated in the first international institutionalized uh, Brazilian presidential transition team in 2002. And this latter experience resulted in the book Transition and Democracy, Inst Institutionalizing the Transferring of Power. He has appeared as a guest speaker at Columbia University, Toronto University, University of Alberta, Université Laval à Montréal, and Instituto Rio Branco. Ambassador Forster was the charge d'affair of the Embassy of Brazil in Washington from June 2019 to October 2020, and he has been the Ambassador of Brazil to the United States since October 2020. And we are very honored to uh, welcome Ambassador Nestor Forster to Georgia State University. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schler, for that very kind introduction. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Ms. Vanessa Ibarra, the mayor's office, for being here. Uh, I want to thank the men most responsible for uh, bringing me to Atlanta, our Consul General here in Atlanta, Ambassador Carlos de Abreu, good friend. Thank you very much, Carlos, you and your team, for helping us organize this great program in this great city. I started complaining a little bit. I expected you would greet me with some Brazilian weather here, which has not been the case. But you have something even better, which is this southern hospitality, this warm way you welcome people who come here. And Ms. Ibarra was just uh, mentioning that. So thank you very much for that, that reception. Uh, I want to propose to you today here, I have 20 minutes to speak. I don't like to go over time, so I'll try to be disciplined. I have a some slides, not more than, I think, 10 slides. I'll go fast over them, just to support what I'm, uh, I'm saying. I want to bring to you some highlights of things that are going on in Brazil, which don't get uh, too much attention sometimes in the media and elsewhere. Uh, and then, you know, of course, I, I look forward to for your questions. 
And uh, I want to particularly thank, you know, all, all the, the faculty that's joining us here today from uh, uh, Georgia State and from Georgia Tech, and also the students. I see a great number of students here on top of those who are with us uh, online. I share the enthusiasm for in-person events, you know. I think it's impossible to do diplomacy, diplomatic work, real work uh, from Zoom, you know. It only goes so far. We need to be eye to eye to have, you know, the warmth of human direct contact. So that's an additional reason why I'm so pleased to be here with you today. Let me jump into the presentation. So, let's see if we make it work nicely. Let me start by highlighting what's been going on in Brazil in terms of the COVID crisis, the pandemic. We have been fighting the disease, you know, which uh, had uh, produced, caused many victims in Brazil. It's very sad, the number of people who were victims of COVID. But there was a strong reaction from uh, our uh, federal government in terms of a vaccination campaign, which has brought us to where we are today. Here we have the number of uh, doses, you know, 270 million doses plus uh, given a population of Brazil. 212 million people. The great news is what we have uh, right here. Today, 95% of the adult population in Brazil has re received at least one shot. 70% have received both. This is growing every day. We are vaccinating over 3 million people a day. There's no vac vaccine hesitancy in Brazil. We actually have a vaccination culture, which started a while ago with campaigns to, to fight polio and other diseases. And uh, in that time, we even created uh, a mascot for va vaccination in Brazil. We call it Zé Gotinha, the Joe Little Drop, very popular with kids in Brazil, believe me. Uh, so this is the results of uh, you know, what we've been doing. You can see here that Brazil you know, is number two uh, in terms of the share of the people being vaccinated every day, second only to Japan at this point. Uh, you know, the source of this is the Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, you know, our world in data for uh, data on the, on the pandemic. The second thing we've done, very important, was highlighted from the get-go, was we needed to fight this, uh, this uh, challenge on two fronts. One was the health one. The other one was the economic and social uh, area. So basically we did two things. One was what we call the emergency aid program with direct cash transfers to those most vulnerable in Brazil. We had, you know, this uh, government databases, including lots of people. We discovered, that's one of the, the things that, uh, you know, good things that happen amidst this terrible crisis, is that we discovered that about 20 million Brazilians, so-called invisibles, were not part of the government database. So they were included. Brazil reached 70, uh, 67 million people, uh, uh, you know, some of the poorest uh, in the country, with a direct cash transfers, instead of creating a new bureaucracy to administer this and so on and, and, you know, get to the end one of the $10 you put in the beginning, what we did is to give cash to the most, uh, the people most in need, you know. Considering those people who have to wake up in the morning and go win the bread for their families, they cannot have the luxury that some of us have of staying home with their laptops in their pajamas and working from home and, you know, not losing, uh, not, not missing much. So those people are the ones who receive these. Another program which was very successful was the, the, a program to support the uh, employment so that people would not be fired during the pandemic and to help small businesses and help the workers. The government introduced legislation that allowed for wage flexibility and hours, working hours flexibilities, so that you know, employers and employees could work out you know, a, a work schedule for the pandemic without people losing their job. That benefited almost 10 million people. The cash transfer, putting all together what was, you know, what we spent in health and the, the social programs, the employment program, amounts to $100 billion. That's about 8% of Brazilian GDP. There is no other developing country that has spent so much during the pandemic. And you see the results. Today, you know, the victims and new cases are at its lowest level since the beginning of the disease. So we, we are. You know, at a great moment, the crisis seems to be almost over. Now, Brazil is also, I want to talk a bit about the re economic uh, repercussion of these measures. Brazil was one of the few countries that was able to introduce, you know, meaningful economic reforms. And we have a very much uh, reform-minded administration in Brazil. Our minister, current minister of the economy, is a Chicago-trained PhD in economics. And uh, he's been trying to cut red tape in Brazil, 
cut privileges of uh, civil servants like myself and others. And one of the very important things he did was this the so, new social security uh, uh, legislation in Brazil. This was done in 2019. We tried to do it for 30 years, 30 years. It basically leveled the playing field for the retirement of people in the public sector and in the private sector, eliminating the distortion that benefited government employees much more than the regular worker. So this is, was very much welcome news, the tremendous ripple effect throughout the economy and, and basically renders the government administration much more efficient, eliminating, you know, uh, uh, fiscal expenses that should not be there in the first place. We also, you know, uh, worked on, oops, sorry, back. We also worked on modernizing our uh, work legislation, you know, bringing more flexibility uh, to the workplace for the benefit of both, uh, uh, you know, uh, employees and uh, employers. And uh, I w just wanna highlight one or two things here. You know, 2021, if you look here, uh, we did some uh, uh, legislation, important legislation to help states and municipalities. But the most important thing, in the midst of a pandemic, we passed the legislation uh, granting autonomy to the central bank to conduct uh, you know, monetary policy. This is a landmark legislation in Brazil done in the midst of a pandemic. You know, there are several others. We're still, the big, some big items are still pending, like the tax reform, administrative reform, which are waiting action in Congress. I'll talk a bit more about uh, reform as uh, we go forward. So all this has, you know, uh, we have tremendous uh, economic opportunity in Brazil in this moment, and we have had uh, a, a resumption of growth in our economy. We are not hit as hard by the pandemic as some of the gloomiest uh, forecasts had anticipated. We actually, uh, you know, are scheduled to grow some 5% is your 5.2% is the official IMF number. Some people in the market say it might be a little bit uh, more than that. Uh, that's bringing, you know, back employment and investment in Brazil. And a big part of the investment is what we call the, the partnerships for uh, investment in Brazil, which has these uh, tremendous numbers that you see in the screen here with uh, opportunities for privatization, concession of roads, uh, uh, privatization of airports. We have already sold 22 airports so far this year. And this is bringing, you know, much needed revenue for the government to pay for the social programs to do what governments have to do in education, health, and so on. Uh, let me move to the very, very uh, current topic of environmental policy in Brazil. And before I, I delve further into what we are doing this week, the major announcements that the Brazilian government has put forward during the convention in Glasgow, uh, the Convention of the Paris Agreement, the, 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 the Convention on Climate Change, uh, I want to tell you where we start, because, you know, I, I think it's no use just to throw a bunch of abstract numbers and percents of this or that without you knowing what's at stake. So the first point I'd like to make is that Brazil is an environmental powerhouse. And why do I say that? The first thing is what's on the screen here. Brazil has some 66.3% of its native vegetation intact in the country. That doesn't make the headlines for the New York Times every day, but that's a fact. That's, uh, you know, being measured by satellites, by our own systems. It's been confirmed by NASA, independent, separate uh, measurements. That's a lot of land, two-thirds of Brazil being preserved. You know, the comparisons are, are there. When we say the 66, that's made basically of two things. One, preserved areas. Areas, I'm sorry, protected areas. Protected areas which are public lands, uh, be them environmental protection areas, national parks, indigenous people's reservations, that makes up about 30% of the Brazilian territory. 30% is protected, public areas which are protected by law. On top of that, to, to reach the 66.3, we have a tremendous effort from the private sector, uh, which follows our very strict environmental legislation, which requires you to put aside part of the land you have, if you have a rural property, if you have a forest property, if you have a property in the Amazon, a certain amount has to be preserved by law. If you're in the south of the country, which is more urban, more populated, that requirement is that you keep about 20% of the original vegetation. As you proceed north and you go to the Amazon, it, the requirement is that you preserve 80% of your property. Okay? 
So that's one, one big thing. That's the private sector helping us preserve and the public and the private uh, uh, effort result in the 66.3%. That brings to Brazil, and there's an interesting comparison here, you see 30% 30, 30 in Brazil of protected areas compared with Australia, the US here with 11% and so on. The average in the world is about 11, 12%. Brazil has 30%. That's a starting point, okay? No commitment yet. This is just the picture as it is today, factual data. But because of that, because of all this preserved land, we also have in Brazil the largest, or one of the largest biodiversities in our planet, the largest number of animal and plant species anywhere on the planet. And we are very proud of that. Uh, let me see if we have one thing here. Boom, boom, boom. No, I want to I wanna bring the, the energy thing into the... Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll move on here uh, without the slide. So the third thing, starting point, Brazil has one of the cleanest energy mixes anywhere in the world. What do I mean by that? About half, 48% to be precise, of all energy consumed in Brazil comes from renewable sources. If we look only into electricity, it's 87.1%, I think it's the latest data, 87.1% comes from renewable fuels such as hydro, biofuel, biomass, wind, which makes about 10% of our energy. Solar is growing very fast. If you think about Brazil, you know, the northeast of Brazil with semi-arid regions, which get, a, you know, a scorching sun uh, throughout the year. There's sunlight throughout the year, basically. So that's our energy mix. So in that regard, Brazil is today, today, no pledge, no commitment made yet. Brazil is today where many most advanced economies want to be in 10 or 20 years. So that's something to, to, to think about. But on top of that, we are bringing more to the table. And here we start, uh, let me, if we look here, December 10, uh, 2020, Brazil had pledged its national contribution, this NDC, National Determined Contribution for the Reduction of Greenhouse Gases, okay, using the 2005 baseline. We committed to reduce 43% by 2030. That already put Brazil ahead of many countries, uh, you know, which are more advanced, like South Korea or even uh, Canada. But we didn't stop there. We brought, you know, to the climate summit, which President Biden convened in, in April, uh, President Bolsonaro participated and brought a couple of new things to the table. One, he committed to end illegal deforestation in Brazil by 2030, to doubling the uh, budget for the enforcement against illegal deforestation and basically against environmental crimes in the Amazon, and of anticipating, uh, anticipating the, the, the date, the target date for the, the, the decarbonization for net zero from 2060 to 2050. Brazil was one of the first developing countries to do that. We didn't stop there. In Glasgow, we have increased the 43%, sorry, the 43%, which was already, you know, a very ambitious target to 50%. This was announced this past Monday, so this is very fresh news. We uh, have officially communicated the, the conference about anticipating a whole decade, the transition for net zero. We have co-sponsored the global methane pledge, methane being one of the gases which cause uh, global warming, uh, even worse than, than, than carbon dioxide. Brazil has joined, you know, the US and European countries in this pledge. And we have anticipated in two years from 2030 to 2028, 28, the elimination of illegal deforestation in the Amazon, okay? On top of that, we also plan to restore it, restore or reforest about 44.5 million acres until 2030. Those are uh, our pledges. On top of that, we also have launched what's being called the National Green Growth Program, which puts basically $50 billion, $50 billion Brazilian resources on the table to prioritize everything that is in support of good environmental policy, as I've been describing here. These numbers might seem, you, you, I, I told you where we're coming from. I mentioned the goals. Now you ask me, well, it's very easy to say, let's go from 43 to 50, right? It's just a target, just a number. Here is why that number is a serious number. And please pay close attention to this. Uh, here is our, our, what the targets were in 2005, what we intended to do by 2030. So let me give you an example. 
the, renewable, the amount of renewable sources in the energy mix, we want a growth of 45% by 2030. They have grown 48.4% last year. You see, we are ahead of, you know, 10 years ahead of, of our goal. The amount of sustainable biofuels in our energy mix went from 20% a goal, 30.2% coming from all these sources. The efficiency gains in the electric sector have, you know, we're, we're almost there. In terms of restoration and reforestation, look at that. The goal, 12 million by 2030, we did 16 by 2020. This is what we have done, okay? In terms of restoring degraded pastures, the goal was 15 million hectares by 2030. We did almost 30 million in 20, by 2018. In terms of animal waste management, look at that. The goal, 4.4 million. We did 38, over 38 million uh, uh, cubic meters between you know, the, the last uh, decade. So it's this, this is what gives bone structure to the commitments we are made, uh, making uh, in Glasgow. Another thing uh, that's important to mention is the role played by agriculture. We see lots of distortion there and people trying to use the excuse of a fake fabricated connection between Brazilian agriculture and, uh, and, uh, and damage to the environment. And let me show you why that is not true. First thing, between 76 and 2016, Brazilian agriculture has grown, uh, uh, above all in, in certain grain cultures, uh, fourfold, 400%. But the amount of land used went up only by 33%. So how do you explain the difference? You know, same thing with beef production. 139% increased between 90 and 2018, and the amount of land used decreased by 15%. The explanation comes in this graph here, which shows the evolution of the blue line, the amount of land used, and the red line, the agricultural production. Do you see what this, this gap here is called productivity? Productivity. How is that achieved? What's the Brazilian miracle in this? It's something called research, agriculture, uh, science-based agriculture, sustainable agriculture, which has been promoted by our agricultural research company, Embrapa. Some of you might be familiar with it. It was created 50 years ago. There's an important connection with the United States in this because first, some of the first engineers and, and uh, agricultural experts who worked there came here to Purdue University in the United States to study the science of agriculture. When they went back to Brazil, they said, look, this is fantastic, but we need to adapt this science to the tropical conditions of Brazil, to our own climate, our own soil, etc." And that's exactly what they did, and the results are there. You, know, you multiply production by four, with you know, very little additional land usage. Look at the amount of land used by Brazil in agriculture compared to other countries. So here you have you know, many European countries with over 70%, 60%. You have India there, 60%, Germany, US 18, and Brazil, 7.6% of our land is used for agriculture. That's it. A country of 12, 212 million people feeding about 1 billion people worldwide, playing a great role in food security around the world, using only 7% of its territory. I already talked about the, the energy mix, so here you have uh, a, a good idea, visual idea of what it entails, you know. Sugarcane products which generate ethanol, fantastic, fantastic biofuel. I don't know if you know this, but a car powered by ethanol emits, produces 90% less carbon dioxide than one that, uh, that uses you know, fossil fuels uh, gasoline. 90% cleaner. And the fossil fuel is exhaustible, whereas you know, ethanol, you can harvest it year after year. And we are doing in Brazil some fantastic things with second generation, third generation ethanol. I'm almost out of time. Uh, you know, as you know, most of the cars produced in Brazil are so-called flex fuel cars. They can run on any combination of ethanol and gasoline, all one, all other, or any mix uh, thereof. So that's, I think, that's what I have to say. I just want to add a couple of, uh, if I have one minute more, I just want to mention, if I can locate here my, my uh, paper, I want to mention something about specifically about education and about things we are doing, including with Georgia State and Georgia Tech. If I can find my paper, my cheat paper here, bear with me one second. So here we go. Yeah, just want to mention a couple of facts, you know, switching the, the topic here. 
But as you know, the U.S. Has, uh, plays a very, very important role in hosting uh, the Brazilian, so-called the Brazilian academic diaspora. There are some examples in the audience here today. I spoke with some, uh, you know, uh, professor, Brazilian professors studying here during their graduate studies in the, these uh, two great institutions uh, that, uh, you know, host us here today. In uh, the last two years for which we had data, we had over 16,000 Brazilian students uh, in the United States. Uh, there's a tremendous cooperation in the whole area of science and technology going on. Uh, we have a bilateral uh, group for, for that cooperation, and it met for the first time after a while. It was not very active, but in the past two or three years, it's been very active and has set up a plan for four years uh, covering you know, all areas from artificial in intelligence to hydrologic uh, monitoring, including in the Amazon, to biotech, space cooperation, uh, and so on. And one thing that I'm particularly excited to mention is the agreement we signed with the Smithsonian Institution last year that will enable the Brazilian Ministry of Education through its network of public schools around the country to bring the great materials of the Smithsonian to a project called Science at the School, Ciencia na Escola, to the public uh, school network uh, in Brazil uh, with a great uh, education and also uh, uh, social uh, uh, impact, I'd say. So this is something we're proud of, and that we have. A, it, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, I also know that you know there's an important presence of the Brazilian community. Ms. Ibarra was just uh, mentioning that here in the city of Atlanta, the surrounding area, and we have also uh, an important presence that perhaps we could even uh, increase of Brazilian students, higher uh, higher education studies studies here in uh, in Georgia State University and Georgia Tech. Uh, I just want to mention, you know. Uh, the cooperation that uh, exists between, uh, one is between Georgia Tech and uh, the University of Campinas. There's a project there on aquatic chemical ecology. I think this uh, has something to do with the Amazon as well. Uh, I read about other project with the University of Bahia. I'm not seeing the information here, but that's something that we, we also support and want to, to, to bring more of. And uh, last, you know, I'm pleased to learn that uh, since the fall of 2019, Georgia Tech students can enroll in uh, Portuguese, elementary Portuguese and, and uh, uh, Portuguese heritage courses, which is, uh, of course, a sign of this very vibrant uh, presence of the Brazilian community here in the region. Uh, last thing, you know, this, there was this the student community here of Georgia Tech organized the, the Braza GT this year, hosting the Braza Summit which is uh, the most important meeting of Brazilian students' associations abroad, and this was, was hosted here. So I'll, I'll stop here just to highlight this and let you know that you know, we at the embassy are open to work with you to promote the exchange of students, to promote scientific research, to promote cooperation between the city of Atlanta and Brazilian cities, state of Georgia and Brazil, especially in the field, some of the fields I mentioned here, there's more that we could mention in our conversation. But I'll stop here not to take too much of your time. Thank you very much. So we'll take just a quick uh, pause while we get configured for our panel discussion. So it'll take two or three minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene and, and get started there. So shall we continue? I think, uh, yeah, we're good to go. Our mics are, are live. We're, we're good. Well, thank you so much. That was a great overview. And, 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 and so we wanted to start our uh, discussion. Uh, Leslie uh, Marsh is going to 
Yes, so I thank you again for being here. I uh, very much appreciate the information you shared with us. Um, I think it was important to highlight some information that sometimes gets lost in, in, uh, in the press. Um, but we're in a very challenging time in history. Um, we've seen global crises, the pandemic, uh, climate change, social unrest, and political division threatens um, economic prosperity, health, and peace around the world. And as, as normal as we might feel right now, back to uh, talking in person, beyond Zoom, the world is still not normal. Um, and uh, never before has it been important to have international cooperation be be between countries, among countries. Um, but it's a very challenging time to do diplomatic work um, in the current political landscapes of our, our countries. How do you balance your diplomatic work with the political work, the political context that we're in right now? Um, how do you um, engage in productive dialogue with international allies on issues such as the environment, um, democracy, public health, while also representing the administration, your political administration at home? Um, how, how do you balance your work as a diplomat in the current period? Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Marsh, what a good question. I love your question because I think this is at you know, the hearts and minds of everyone when you look today and you see what you just described, the many challenges we have. And that sometimes when we talk to you know, people older than we are, you know, talk to our grandparents, it seems that they lived through times which were as challenging as that. But what I like about your question is you know, the diplomatic work versus, let's say, domestic politics. Mm -hmm. you know? How do we reconcile those? There is a tension there, I agree with you. And that, that tension is our uh, daily breath, if you will. You know? Why? Because, you know, talking about Brazil and the United States, we are both democracies, democratic countries. And in a democratic country, in a, in a totalitarian country, in a dictatorship, it's different. We don't have that sort of, of, of tension. But in a democracy, you have people who do politics, and that's necessary, and that's good. Democracy without politics is what, you know? Uh, so we have, we have the politics, but we also have the policy side and the foreign policy side. One way to look at it is you see that the foreign policy is but one aspect of a platform of domestic policy. When you want to run for office, you want to say, my policy for agriculture will be this, for subsidy, it will be that, for energy, for the environment. My foreign policy will be so and so. So there's a, a, a very democratic element in that. But there is also a tension, and the tension, as far as I can see, I, I don't want to be too long winding this, but I, I, I've thought a lot about this topic, and I'm glad you raised it, because Foreign policy deals necessarily with, with, with what is more permanent in terms of the national objectives, national interests of a country. The longer term, the broader horizon, what has staying power? Foreign policy. On the other hand, you have the politics, the day-to-day, -day, the domestic, the partisan politics, which deal with things which are much more immediate, much more volatile, if you wish. You know, ideally, these things are, you know, I've been doing this, uh, this, uh, this job for 36 years. I remember 36 years ago when I entered the Diplomatic Academy, and my dear colleague here, Carlos, has a longer memory than I, I think. Uh, you know, it, it was not like it is today, basically because we didn't have instantaneous communication. I think I'm not blaming it, but it's, it, we have it. And that allows for a contamination of things that used to be, let's say, contained in the domestic realm. Immediately, they become a part of uh, foreign affairs. So we have to ad administer that. How do we do it? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we do environmental policy and so on? Our approach, I'm talking about the Brazilian approach, is not, not a personal comment, is what I try to do here today. To work with, the, try to understand reality, try to understand what's going on. Try to work with facts mm -hmm. and objective data, not with our wishful thinking, with our imagination, or our ideological fantasies, or caricatures, etc. No, try to understand reality and do, do your best with it. And, uh, you know, I'd say just to wrap up that the U.S. And, and Brazil are very well positioned to do this work together in terms of, you know, things we can cooperate, do together in terms of foreign policy, because we begin from the, the very uh, same foundation, the very same basis, which is the values Brazil and the U.S. share, which are democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights, respect for promotion of economic freedom, so that's, that's the basis, and upon that foundation, we can work with our institutions, you know, our co bilateral cooperation, and try to reduce the political noise, which is an inevitable part of the landscape. 
in a democracy. Thank you. Uh, welcome. My name is Ryan Carlin. Uh, I'm the director for the Center for Human Rights and Democracy, and I uh, just want to thank you for your response. I think it highlighted uh, some of the challenges uh, of, of the current environment, instantaneous information, uh, but also contextualizing it, uh, again, within the broader political process. Uh, and um, you mentioned in your remarks how, how you like this, uh, this dialogue and doing diplom diplomacy in person. And in that spirit, uh, we've, we've invited um, some representatives of our faculty uh, across Georgia State, and they've, uh, they've um, put together some, some questions that we would like to uh, get your thoughts on. The first, uh, our first faculty member is Dr. Salamao uh, de Farias. He's an associate professor in international business in our Robinson College of Business, and his, uh, his connection with Georgia State began with an, inter an exchange uh, and a relationship we have with the Universidad de Pernambuco. So uh, go ahead, please, um, Dr. de Farias. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the nice presentation, very objective, informative. I'll try to combine my questions because they related to international business. Uh, where does Brazil stand in the current global economy, and what advice would you give to those who want to invest in Brazil? And at the same time, in what aspects does Brazil need to improve to become more competitive and attractive to uh, international investors? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farias. Uh, excellent question. Allows me to, you know, delve a little bit into things I just touched in, in, the, in the presentation. What Brazil wants to do in the international uh, in the international scene is to, you know, participate, be a more active participant in uh, the whole uh, flows of trade and investment across the globe. And uh, what we need to do for that is to continue to do more of what we've been doing. I, I highlighted some of the, the economic reforms that have been undertaken in recent years in Brazil. And uh, we, we wish to do more. Of course, the pandemic is, you know, it's, it's a, an explanation and an excuse, but we, we are getting out of it uh, to, to try to do more. And basically what we want is to open up our economy, you know, eliminate uh, unnecessary bureaucracy, inefficiency, privileges, as I mentioned with the pension system uh, uh, legislation reform that, that we did. Uh, basically make Brazil more competitive, generate more opportunity for Brazilians to get good jobs, you know, and uh, to, for that economic reform is essential. Also things that we're doing in terms of science, technology, space cooperation, we understand that that opens new roads, new possibilities for us to, to do uh, even more. Great, well, thank you, Ambassador. I, I wanted to, to, you know, take the, the discussion a little bit more further into that um, concept of how uh, trade and commerce between the U.S. and Brazil may be impacted by the political. So pulling it back a little bit to that you know, opening question, but I think this is really important. Um, especially in light of the October 14th letter it was written by Congressman Hank Johnson. So he's the representative from the 4th Congressional uh, District of Georgia. It was co-signed by 63 members of Congress, and it called for President Biden to return, quote, U.S.-Brazil relationships to the pre-Trump status quo, at least until a new leader, more aligned with democratic and human rights values, is elected in Brazil. So pretty, uh, it was a, a pretty um, direct letter. It was uh, one that, that I wanted to, to ask you about. In terms of what ramifications do you think this sort of letter or the sentiment it represents may have for Brazil and U.S. relationships, in particular, um, how might it impact us here in Georgia, where this is really, you know, this very uh, critical letter was coming from our, our leadership here? Very good. I'm glad you asked that question. It's very relevant, specifically because of that reason. I invite you all to see the reply I wrote to uh, the congressman and to, uh, I delivered it individually to every single signatory of that letter. So a couple of points. Number one, I think it's a great example of what Dr. Marsh was, uh, was uh, asking here about the intersection of you know, domestic politics and international policy. So in this specific case, it's not the role my role as the ambassador of Brazil in Washington, or the role of my embassy, or the role of our foreign ministry, to engage in a, in a debate on domestic politics, politics with a, a, a popularly elected representative. Mm -hmm. okay? That's why we, we bring the discussion to another level. What we do is discuss policy. And we can disagree on that, and it's fine. And you know, 
I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I disagree even with myself, you know, not to mention with others. But it's very natural that France, you know, Brazil, US would, would, would have some disagreements. What I don't think is very, very helpful in the approach taken by those who signed that letter is to try to stop dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's try to, you know, uh, uh, make it impossible or, or, or request, because the letter was uh, addressed to President Biden, stop cooperating with Brazil, stop talking and so on, because that's the anti-diplomacy, that's anti-foreign affairs, that's, uh, you know, that's a cessation of the very reason why we have relations between countries, which is try to cooperate, to work together towards a common good, you know? And uh, so there's this element which is not very constructive, but we take it on a very constructive basis. And if you see my reply there, uh, we try to address the concerns one by one, dispel where we have, you know, misinformations, distortions or misunderstandings, you know? and. Uh, try to highlight our areas where we have challenges. Okay. Deforestation in the Amazon, that exists, that's a challenge. That's getting better, that's not getting worse. We are doing everything we can to fight that. We give you a concrete example. The data is showing it. If you take the months from June through September, which are the four driest months in the Amazon, there's less rain, so you have more illegal activity. That's on the, the historical series. If you take a look, you'll see that. So for the past four months, we had a reduction year on year, 2021 on 2020, of about 11% a reduction on illegal deforestation. If we compare with 2019, that goes up to 30% reduction. Why, why, why did the reduction came about? Because of what the federal government is doing by doubling the budget for, inform, for enforcement, which I mentioned, by allocating more, hundreds more of National Guards people involved, the National Force it's called, involved directly in fighting environmental crimes in the Amazon, be it illegal deforestation, but also illegal mining uh, uh, and, and so on. So, you know, this is paying off. We have the armed forces. We have the Brazilian army with 3,000 troops on the ground fighting these uh, criminal organizations. We need to do more. We are committed to do more. You saw the level of commitments we have here. Nobody treasures the Amazon more than we do. But if you read uh, some, uh, some uh, biased press or, or these sorts of manifestations, you get total wrong impression. How many of you here know that 84% of the Amazon is intact? 84% is intact. With all these things, they are cutting a, a stadium, uh, a brave stadium by minute there. You know, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the reality. You know, 84% of the Amazon forest stands intact. So we think that Brazil should be commended for that. Well, thank you. And I want to um, invite uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Jennifer, Jennifer McCoy, um, from the Department of Political Science and the College of Arts and Science to ask you a question. Thanks, Mr. Ambassador. Great to have you here. Um, Brazil's preparing for elections next year, yet the president has raised questions about the integrity of the election process, especially the voting machines that you've been using for the last 20 years. I'm familiar with those machines. Um, do you think that this, uh, these questions will cause distrust in the system that might lead voters to abstain from voting, to not participate? And what are the efforts that are being done to ensure confidence in the elections? Excellent question. Thank you very much. So, you know, there was a debate about the, the electoral system, the voting machines, etc. We see that part as a, you know, again, an open democratic debate. It was a very vibrant debate around that. Uh, there was um, uh, uh, some decision, I think, taken by Congress on that regard, which seemed to pacify the matter. So uh, I see, as far as I see it from my, my position in Washington, I think that's a settled issue. Uh, as for, uh, you know, voters' participation, in Brazil, we have something which we call compulsory democracy. People, voting is not optional in Brazil. You're obliged to vote. It's a requirement of law. Everybody who's above a certain age, I think today it's 18, uh, but begins voluntary at 16, uh, everybody above uh, 18 years old has to vote. If you don't vote, you have to justify why didn't you vote? And you have to pay a fine if you don't justify. So voter inhibition, is, is I, I don't think it, it's, it's going to be an issue. I don't think it, it's ever been an issue. And, uh, you know, we will have a, a very, very vibrant election, election campaign uh, uh, in Brazil, one of, you know, with the U.S., the, the biggest uh, democracies in our hemisphere. And uh, 
we will look forward to continue this relation, you know, beyond the election, the next year's election, the many, the many that will come. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Our question now moves to the domain, the domain of public health. Uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Cassie White, Associate Professor of Anthropology with our next question. Hi, Ambassador. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Um, so both the U.S. and Brazil have lessons to learn from each other, I think, in terms of providing health care to all of the people residing within their borders. Um, Brazil's Sistema Unica de Saúde is the largest government health care system in the world and could be a great model for the U.S., but over the years, the swoosh, so, uh, this system has been weakened by government policies and been marred by insufficient funding and privatization of the healthcare system. So are the plans in place to are there plans in place to strengthen Swoosh in such a way that Brazilians regain confidence in the system and in such a way that the US could even look to Brazil as a model for expanding healthcare coverage and access? Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. White. Uh, I love the questions here. They're all very good, very to the point. You know what you're talking about. Uh, so Brazil has the SUS, Sistema Único de Saúde, the unitary uh, health system. And uh, you know, it deserves to be praised by many things. It's not perfect, it's far from perfect, but it played a great role. The data I presented to you with the great strides in vaccination is a witness to that. We, ha we have in Brazil 38,000 posts of vaccination around our country. That's the system at work. We did something, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I, I, I like to, to, to mention this because it makes me really proud. We in Brazil, in a region like the Amazon, which is not, you know, easily accessible. The Amazon, you know, it's about eight times the size of the state of Texas, which is the largest American state. So when you talk about Amazon, it's eight Texas. So imagine trying to vaccinate half a million people distributed in tribes all around that vast area. We have succeeded in vaccinating, fully vaccinating, two doses, about 80, 80, 80, 80 percent of the indigenous peoples in tribes in the Amazon. That's again, it's not only the SUS, not magic, it's the work, you know, there's the armed forces were there, civil society was there, NGOs were there, uh, the National uh, Health and Visa was there. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous local communities, of course, helped. Tremendous effort. But uh, look, we have great health cooperation with the United States. We don't see our model as perfect. You know, Brazilians will tell you, will have lots of criticism uh, about it you know, about it being two-tiered and so on. I think that's the challenge of all, you know, great uh, uh, democratic countries, again, which have this, you know, massive populations, but 212 million people. It's very hard to cover everyone and to provide the quality that everybody uh, would like to have. So there's a, a balance in a mix there. And I, I wouldn't go, out, go around uh, telling people that we have the, the, the answer for all those very, very uh, complex issues. But it's something we're proud of, and I think, uh, you know, there's always room for, for improvement. Just let me take the opportunity to highlight the great cooperation we've had with the U.S. in fighting the pandemic. A couple of things. Private sector from the U.S. helped, private sector in Brazil helped as well. The White House, in the previous administration and in the current administration, set up a group of about 15 countries, scientists, high-level discussion, to discuss therapeutics, vaccination strategy, logistics among these countries, what you're doing uh, when the, the P1, the variant from Brazil, was uh, first isolated. The scientists who did it, the genome sequencing, uh, came to, to, you know, to the White House to, to participate in this discussion. This has been going on for two, since the, the beginning of the pandemic. This is fantastic. No, few people know about this. We also have, in Brasilia, in our capital, we have the only health attaché in the U.S., the CDC attaché for South America. It's based in Brasilia. It's a tremendous job, you know, uh, going to the regions, uh, uh, working together with Brazilian health authorities. So there's tremendous cooperation. I agree with you, we should do more, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your response on that. Um, I'd like to turn our attention back to the climate. And you, you referred to the 26th uh, United Nations Conference on Climate Change that's currently taking place in Glasgow. And uh, nations across the globe have been falling short and reaching go goals, uh, global goals. Um, and despite warnings for, from experts for decades, we continue to see global rising temperatures. We see uh, increased drought, uh, storms are worse, and so forth. Uh, but Brazil has been historically at the forefront of renewable energy sources, the flex fuel that you were talking about before, as well as developing hydroelectric power plants. But um, what Brazil does in its own country 
it, it depends on what happens elsewhere. So we all, we live on the same planet. So my question has two parts. On the one hand, adaptation has been put forth as um, one response to climate change, build walls to keep the water from rising and so forth. What are some of the ways that Brazilian businesses and government are seeking to adapt to the vulnerabilities that are caused by climate change? And then, should I pause or give the... No, no, should should pause. And then the second part, on the other hand, mitigation and collaboration continue to be put forth as strategies for combating climate change uh, to the current climate crisis. What are some of the ways that Brazil envisions collaborating with other nations to, to reach global goals? Um, and I'll stop there. Another excellent question, Dr. Marsh. Thank you, thank you so much for that. So at the domestic level, there are many things we are doing. Some of them I highlighted here. Let me talk about things which are not there. So you see that Brazil is this agricultural, agri-food uh, powerhouse. We're feeding one billion people around the planet. Mm -hmm. But we want to do that, as I said, in a sustainable way, in, you know, using science and uh, you know, decarbonizing our agriculture as much as, as possible. Towards that end, we have adopted a program, which in Brazil is cute because it's ABC, Agricultura, Agricultura de Baixo Carbono, Low Carbon Agriculture, uh, you know, based on, on research done by the Greater Research Agri uh, Agriculture Research Company in Brapa. And that has many initiatives associated with it. One of them, I don't know if I mentioned this, is the rotation that we are doing between forestry, livestock, and agriculture itself, which helps to fixate carbon on the soil and you know, have less emissions. There's another thing we're doing in agriculture, it's called direct, direct planting. Is that exist in English? Mm -hmm. What is direct planting? It's you, you basically don't need to till, to till to work the soil before you put the seed on the ground. You put the seed on the ground the way it is. Mm -hmm. Not every region, every area that mm -hmm. lends itself to this sort of approach, but by not revolving, not tilling the, the, the soil, you're not releasing nutrients, you're not releasing humidity, not releasing carbon. So the gains that are, you know, this is technology, agricultural technology at, at its uh, cutting edge. Well, that's uh, something we're doing. We, we want to do more. Let me just mention one thing we're doing with ethanol, and then I'll go to the second part of your question, which is this. We all know about ethanol, so I mentioned this. Uh, replace the fossil fuel with something you can plant and harvest every year. But still people say, well, but there's still the carbon footprint of the, the, of the sugar cane plant in our case. We also do ethanol with corn, like you do here in the United States. We just do more with, with, uh, with sugar cane. But what we're doing is this. Traditionally, we use the stock, you know, you've seen all mm -hmm. sugar cane. So we use the stock of it, we press it, we, we distill it, and we make ethanol. And the rest goes to waste, it used to go to waste. We have found out that we can use, aside from the stock, we can do what's called second generation ethanol. So we're using the same plant, and we use the leaves, and we can process them and generate ethanol and increase the production of the same carbon footprint between 30 and 40%. But wait. Call now, and we'll add third-generation <laughs> ethanol. I'm not kidding. This is happening. This is a big company in Brazil called Raizen, one of the largest companies. It's one example. There are others doing this. Look what they do. So you use the stock, you use the leaf, and then you throw it out. You used to throw it out, the refuge, whatever, whatever is left. This what, what is left now is put in special lakes, in special pools they built. And with biotechnology, using a specific bacteria, which helps decompose this, they generate bioelectricity to power the whole operation in the ethanol, corn, uh, sugarcane uh, plant. So that's something cool, I think, that we're doing, right? Internationally, you know, uh, we are working with the U.S. and there's, there's you know, the, the, the level of cooperation we have the U.S. government. I don't have time to mention this specifically, but I should highlight what we're doing in the environmental side. You know, when, uh, when the Biden administration was coming in, we saw the priority that would come for the environment, for everything that had to do with climate change. Okay? I myself had the, the, the great honor of speaking with our president. I spoke with President Bolsonaro and asked his permission, said, President, we need to engage with the Americans as soon as we can to work together because this is going to be a priority for them. It's a priority for us. He said, go ahead. I myself reached out to Special Presidential Envoy John Kerry, former Secretary of State, this was done in February, 
okay? And it's not breaking news anymore, we can share, you know? Uh, and we set up this dialogue, which is ongoing now in Glasgow. They are in Glasgow there talking, Brazilians, Americans working together, both at the high level of the, the special envoy, who talks directly with our foreign minister, with our minister of the environment, and at the working level, you know, people who deal with the nitty gritty of the technical details involved in this. So this is great cooperation, but there's more. We are working to do, to bring, the, the, Brazil and the US are the greatest producers of ethanol in the world. Mm -hmm. Here based in corn, Brazil, sugar cane. We're working together not to sell more ethanol, ethanol around the world, to have this mercantilist uh, short-sighted view, but to enable other countries to produce ethanol at home, to diminish mm -hmm. the whole question of uh, uh, you know, uh, emissions and, and, and climate change. For instance, we're working very closely with the Indian government. Mm -hmm. Look at the size of India. Mm -hmm. okay? Earlier this year, we had missions from Brazil, but the US is working, the industry, this private sector and government are working together. We went to India, we went to Indonesia, one more Asian country we went to, and we are set, we should be going now in November to China. Now, look at the size of China, the Chinese economy. If we can bring them to power their cars with ethanol, imagine the good it would do to the quality of air in large Chinese cities, the good it would do to the environment, you know, globally. Yeah, I was going to ask a follow-up question. If there have been cooperation with other uh, member nations of the, the BRICS, for example, with um, energy sharing technology uh, yeah. for renewable resources. Yeah. That's exactly it. We want to share the technology we develop with Embrapa and others to plant ethanol in this very environmentally friendly, sustainable way, you know, first, second, third generation. And we want to teach our Indian friends and others, and including in Africa, mm -hmm. there's tremendous potential because of the climate conditions in African countries. And Brazil has a traditional, very close relation with many, not only the Portuguese speaking uh, uh, countries, but other countries in Africa. And we want to take, Embrapa is already there, but we, we want to do more specific in this area of the environment. Mm -hmm. And move away from coal, yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate them. Um, the next question moves to um, the perspective of the U.S. administration. The question comes from Dr. Henry Carey, Associate Professor of Political Science. Is Dr. Carey here today? Yes. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to have you here in Atlanta, Ambassador. Um, what would interest me would be to know how the election of Joe Biden has affected Brazil's foreign or domestic policies. What measures has the Brazilian government taken to increase the mutual interests and affinities that exist between the countries since the exit of Donald Trump? Excellent question, excellent question. Builds upon things we, we, we have discussed here. I will not repeat myself, you know, the framework is set. So specifically with the, with the new new administration coming in in January, we were saying, you know, all along last year, some people in Brazil, uh, you know, doomsayers were saying, well, if the Democrats win, if President Biden is elected, uh, you know, Brazil and the U.S. are going to be at odds and so on. And we said, no, 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 that's not going to happen for the very simple reason that Brazil and the U.S. share concrete interests. So the relations between countries are not the product of personal relations between the heads of state. This can help, this can help, this can make things, you know, more, more uh, expedite, let's say. But you cannot base a relation in a country as complex as Brazil or the United States with, you know, the tremendous, tremendous diversity and the, the, the very broad agenda that we have on the relationship between two, two people. So, uh, you know, I've been more than vindicated with everything we've been doing with the Biden administration. I already mentioned, you know, the tremendous cooperation and dialogue in the environmental area. Let me mention one area I have not talked much about, which is the, the defense cooperation area, which is a very traditional, goes all the way back to Second World War II, when Brazil sa sent not one or two, but 25,000 Brazilian soldiers to fight against Nazism and fascism in the theater in Southern Italy, fighting shoulder to shoulder with uh, American soldiers to defeat this terrible enemy. And this cooperation goes on to this day, and just, you know, the Biden administration began 20th of January inauguration. A month later, we realized the largest military, joint military exercise ever conducted, where Brazilians came to the United States and basically invaded Louisiana, you know? Parachutists, 200 of them, jumping a night jump uh, uh, from a, an Embraer aircraft called uh, K390. It's a new aircraft transportation aircraft, state of the art. So it's a test for that as well. 
and it, it, it went really, really well. I heard praise for that from uh, the uh, commander of Southcom, Admiral Craig Fowler. You know, he was impressed by the level of skills of the Brazilian uh, parachutists and also the equipment that was employed. So that's, you know, uh, one area that we haven't mentioned here where we have done great, great cooperation. But that, that, that didn't stop there. In April, Brazil signed, Brazil was the first Latin American country to join the Artemis Agreement. I don't know if you're familiar with that, the NASA project. Artemis in Greek mythology was the sister of Apollo, right? So that's why it's the, it's the most ambitious space exploration program anywhere in the world today. It's, it's set to take the first woman to the moon, the first African-American astronaut to the moon, and from there take it to, uh, to have a, a, man, a, a mission to Mars. Okay? So this is another area of cooperation. We're studying things we can do together. I'll just mention one, not to be lo too long-winded here, but uh, in 2024, we're going to be celebrating the bicentennial of Brazil-U.S. relations. So back to your point there. Brazil has with the United States the longest, the longest lived relations, diplomatic relations we have with any country in the world. Not even our next door neighbors in South America have this because, you know, we had good relations. I mean, at the get-go with Argentina, for instance, but we went to war in 1825 and 1850 and so on. Not boring with that. But with the U.S., we have an unbroken succession, you know, almost 200 years, going to be 2024, which is the, the, the date, the year, when NASA uh, wishes to, to put, you know, the first mission on the moon. My diplomatic dream here, if you allow me, would be to have one of the experiments we are considering, which is a Brazilian rover, which would collect, you know, uh, samples from minerals from the moon to be examined in, in Brazil, that it would fly with the Brazilian flag and the American flag, symbolizing this great friendship of, you know, 200 years. Thank you very much. Uh, following up on that a little bit, when we had the, uh, the, the, um, the Argentine ambassador to the United States here last month, he spoke to the World Affairs Council of Atlanta, and someone asked him, you know, what can we do to improve uh, um, relations within South America and cooperation within South America? And he said, he said, coal and steel, and he was referencing World War II and, and how he, those, two, uh, those two areas provided a, a basis of cooperation. And so someone pushed him and said, well, what would be the coal and steel? And so I'm going to ask you, what would be, are there a coal and steel that you see out there that might uh, further, I mean, there's already a great deal of cooperation in, in, in South America uh, and, and throughout the hemisphere, but if there are a couple of areas, maybe it's the moon, maybe it's uh, you know, the, the environment, whatever. Um, what, would you, what would you say? What would you pinpoint? Well, the Ambassador uh, Arguello is a good friend of mine, and I will not dispute uh, what he said. You know, Brazil and Argentina, you know, our relationship plays a, a, a very important role for everything that goes on in, in, uh, in South America, being the two largest economies. And, uh, you know, we have lots of things going on in, in South America that don't get sometimes much attention. But there are, there are many uh, challenges, new challenges in the region. I'd say the one big challenge is the whole question of democracy and dem democratic governance. You know, with you look what's going on in Venezuela and the impact that has for the countries in the region. You know, it has impacted Colombia uh, more than Brazil with, uh, you know, two million uh, refugees. But Brazil received 500,000 refugees, you know, fleeing the dictatorship from Nicolás Maduro. And of those 500,000, we are happy to report that 265,000 decided to stay in Brazil. And Brazil received them, and, uh, you know, I quote my, my friend from the mayor's office here, you know, uh, welcoming with open arms the, those people in a, an operation called Welcome, Operação Acolhida, which has earned praise from the United Nations for the way we are receiving these people and giving them documents, opportunity to work, a vaccine, and so on trying to integrate them in the south of Brazil, where economic opportunity is. We have that, that great amount of Venezuelans. There's, you know, political challenges. Uh, you know, uh, if you have a common basis, for instance, the, the democratic values, then you can work with countries and cooperation can flourish. If you have a sincere uh, desire to improve economic and trade cooperation, like we had, for instance, when we launched Mercosur back in 1991, the whole idea was, look, we have this platform, we will work together to, to increase in the scale of our markets that will attract more investment, will enable us to have more technology, increase our exports, our relationship with the rest of the world, with trade and, and finance flows uh, from around the world. That worked for some time, 
But there was a hijacking of that agenda for political aims. I will not uh, name any names or, or get into further detail, but it was, you know, it lost its original character. So it was a great chance for economic trade cooperation, which was diverted into something else. Uh, we've been trying to, uh, you know, recuperate its original meaning, its original sense, and uh, we, we, I think we're making some good strides. We recently, two weeks ago, there was a meeting with the Argentinian foreign minister came to Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, and we decided to slash tariffs across, across the board by 10%, which is a boost for our competitiveness and opening up of our, of our economies. So that's one concrete area that we can uh, cooperate. Great, thank you. And I'd like to um, invite, so one of our colleagues, uh, Flavia Marais, um, is here from the Department of Geosciences. And one of the things that you mentioned early on was your, you know, how we can collaborate and, and work at the sort of educational level. So she has a, a question for you on this uh, topic. Good afternoon, Ambassador. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, my question is about international cooperation in research and education. So I'm interested in knowing more about what are the plans of the current administration in providing incentives, support, funding for Brazilian students from both undergraduate and graduate levels to come to study in the U.S. and also from the incentives from Brazil to receive American college students there to promote uh, more exchange in research and education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent question. Look, there is a, a, there is a natural attraction, uh, you know, for Brazilian students, for the great American university system, including these great institutions you are here. Yeah, you know, I don't need to tell you about Georgia Tech, how pioneer it was, uh, you know, in the 19th century when it was created and the role it plays in the world to the respect it commands in engineering, computer sciences and, and, and beyond. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that the, the, the University of the State of Georgia is one of the largest universities in the United States, over 50,000 students. So that's a magnet in itself, you know. Uh, from the government point of view, uh, what I've seen is this. We have programs in place, especially for graduate students. There is a focus on STEM, you know, science, technology, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, very great. Uh, we also have in, uh, specific programs between universities, partnerships between universities. But there is, I see some hesitancy from the Ministry of Education with the great challenges it has domestically in Brazil with basic education and so on, of engaging in too much an ambitious program uh, of uh, you know, sending students abroad as, as interesting and, and, and fruitful and useful as, as that can be. One thing I've, I've seen, and that goes on with different institutions, is that we might get more bang for the buck, so to speak, if we invest scarce public monies in bringing American professors to Brazil, where they can teach Brazilian students, you know, whole classes, instead of sending individual students from Brazil to the U.S., talking about the undergrad level. You know? So that's, that's one idea that's out there. Uh, I wouldn't expect, uh, 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 you know, in the immediate future, big programs on that because of the challenges we have. But of course, we have already in place several institutions, both public and private, we do just that, what, you, what you're, you're referring to, Professor Moraes, in terms of promoting, you know, increased cooperation, more co cooperation, joint research cooperation in basic science, using opportunities that you have here in the United States with the National Science Fin Foundation, which funds so much uh, basic science, basic research. We need that also in Brazil. And, uh, you know, we have ongoing projects. I wouldn't expect anything massive, but I would explore what's already there and, uh, and can, can, we can work with. I would add a, a point to that is one of the things, the technologies and one of the ways that we can actually engage with what we have at present is to do more of that sort of virtual exchange and a lot of the sort of joint classes where students and professors can work collaboratively. And uh, that's been a big um, you know, project that, that Dr. Schlor has put huge uh, university level energy behind us to, to really do that. So that's an area where I think there's some some great follow-up. I wanted to see if we, we had a, we have a, it looks like we have a few more minutes for, for some questions. A few minutes there. for questions from the audience. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Would anyone like to pose a question? What haven't, what haven't we talked about, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please step up to the microphone. Yes, by all means. 
So you've talked, oh, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit, shouldn't I? Um, my name is Alexis Powers, and I am a graduate of the master's program in anthropology and applied linguistics here. You've talked a lot about <laughs> the interplay of domestic and foreign policy and, and politics. Um, but what I'm interested in is how has the perception of the Bolsonaro administration affected your job personally? So how has that affected how you do the foreign policy that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I get what you're saying about the perception of the Bolsonaro administration. You, you mean in terms of media and... Uh... Yeah, I, I would say that, at least from my perspective, that the, administ the Bolsonaro administration has been a little uh, controversial in, in several of <laughs> the um, values that, uh, that he has held and, and discussed publicly. And you have made a great point talking about that separation and that domestic politics does not necessarily have to um, interfere with how foreign policy is enacted, but I just want to know more about like your personal experience and how maybe that controversial perception of the leader of Brazil might affect um, interactions that you have on a day-to-day -day basis to try and enact um, good change overall with the, the foreign policy uh, values that you have discussed at length. Very good, very good. Got it. Well, thank you for that question. It allows me to reiterate something I think I mentioned, I touched here and there uh, during uh, the, the, the question uh, session, which is this. Uh, there's no personal thing in this, from my point of view. Why not? Because I'm a professional diplomat. Okay? I'm dealing, uh, President Bolsonaro is the head of the great country I represent. He was elected by 57 million Brazilians in an open and fair election. So he's a democratic uh, leader. He, you know, some people might think he's controversial, as people you know, all around the world think other people are controversial, especially those we disagree with. You know? So uh, you know, that, that's part, part of our routine. You know, I, I've seen uh, you know, so many presidents uh, uh, in Brazil, and uh, when, when I say the things I'm saying here, perhaps that's the best uh, reply I can, I can provide to you. So when I say what I'm saying here, I'm not uh, promoting President Bolsonaro as a partisan politician. I'm talking about the head of the Brazilian state, you know? And uh, I, I, I would and I should do it for any other leader that was democratic, uh, democratically ele elected in Brazil. It would be, a, 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 I would be betraying my role, my job, my vocation, if I would turn this into something partisan, you know, and try to uh, engage into what we mentioned here, the domestic policy, po politics. Our, our challenge, including when we had, you know, hard-edged uh, uh, letters, etc., is to stay within the realm of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I think you also brought up a good point earlier about um, the diplomatic work is, it's a different temporal scale. It's long-term, it's, 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 it's not the immediate here and now, it's the, the bigger picture. And also, I appreciated how you um, you said it's about looking at the facts. What are the facts? Uh, Evidence-based discussions. Yeah. And I think I might use that as my my role as chair of my department. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm flattered. I'm flattered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thinking about that, that, that time scale is a really important yeah. one that I don't think is often explicitly named and mentioned as much. But just thinking about the longer term, the trajectory of the you know priorities and the, you know, the strategies that are most likely going to outlive administrations, especially in democracies where right. there's going to be changes over time, but some of those other things are the sort of bedrock of that relationship. And, and from what I get in your answer, it's really about you know, preserving and maintaining and building on that. Um, I think we, we, we have time for one more quick question before we, we wrap up. Is there... Can I just yeah, add oh, something please. to what you said? It's, 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 your, your summary there is perfect. And look, at the very outset of the Biden administration, first days, we had a letter as pointed as the, the one you referred to by, by Congressman Hank Paulson, coming from a, some sort of uh, NGO or association, etc., in the United States, 
basically uh, asking the Biden administration not to engage with Brazil it's, and so on and so forth. So that's partisan politics. An example, Exhibit A, that's partisan politics. The reply, the reply came from uh, Ms. Saki, the, the communicator there at the White House. She said, she said, the relationship with Brazil is not a partisan relation. It's not based on personal relations. It has a strategic character for both countries because we share the same principles of democracy, the rule of law. She said that, what I said, rule of law, respect for human rights, economic freedom, and so on. So that, you know, that came from the White House. So you, you see what's foreign policy and domestic politics. You know, I'm not saying that people should not try to play their game. You know, that's democracy. You know, play your game. But, uh, you know, uh, we will stay with the foreign policy with a longer view because that's what we have to do. Somebody has to do that job, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will. Well, um, good afternoon, Ambassador. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stefano Benetti. I'm an undergraduate student in the course of material science engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And I'd like to recall the topic of defense, which you briefly mentioned, and talk about a letter that was sent by certain Democrat Congress members here in the United States, notably Alexander Ocasio-Cortez to President Joseph R. Bennett Biden, regarding removing our country from the status of preferential ally at NATO. And because based on allegations of Brazil not respecting human rights, and especially the Bolsonaro administration commit, uh, committing many crimes of genocide, for example, was a claim they made in response to like deaths because of the coronavirus pandemic. I'd like to ask you, how did you think this impacted or will futurely impact the relationship between the two countries? Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for bringing that. You know, we discussed the letter. That's the letter by, by Congressman Post. It's the, same, the very same letter. So the charge is to say that uh, President Bolsonaro administration violated human rights. You know, what are we talking about? You know, what human rights of whom? You know, so these blank uh, sort of uh, accusations thrown there, they are just destructive. They just want to, you know, paint a certain picture, usually a caricature. So, you know, we can address concerns when they are voiced in a civilized manner and, and, uh, and point, you know, look, we have concerns with this or that, or, you know, we have a problem with this community here. But when it's blank like that, there's nothing to be said. We have a great record of human rights. Human rights are enshrined in the Brazilian constitution. You know, we have a whole ministry devoted to that, and I think that they are, they are doing a great job. As for the defense aspect of it, of the Brazil being declared a major uh, non-NATO non ally, of course, there's one thing has nothing to do with the other, number one. Number two, that was something that there was a decision by the, the U.S. government, and, uh, you know, just highlighting the, this very traditional cooperation that Brazil has based on the principles I just alluded to, among which is the respect not the violation, the respect for human rights. Now, to this genocide talk about the genocide and pandemic, I think it's a bit disingenuous to try to blame the leader of any country. You know, can we do that with the American president? Would it be fair? Or the president of any country to blame everybody who, who dies from a pandemic? It's the fault of the president. I, I think this is nonsensical as far as I can see. So, you know, not, not, nothing much to add. Thank you for your question. And it certainly, and that wades into, I think, that, you know, some of the questions and, you know, reflecting that. And that was really part of when it, we were having the discussion initially about the session is really trying to think about how that sort of the rhetoric and the things that really, you know, tug at those emotional or, you know, that, that make your job either, you know, more difficult or how you sort of stay above that fray. And I really appreciate your candor and, 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 and willingness to engage that uh, in particular. Um, it looks like we're just about at time right now. So I want to first thank the ambassador for, for being here today um, and for your, 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 your time with us and, and the level and the, again, the candor with which you engaged. Um, you know, certainly I want to thank Ryan and Leslie um, for your you know, participation in this uh, as well. And um, the, the sort of thanks also Carlos, of course, behind the scenes, making, uh, these, these connections happen. Um, and Vanessa and Wolfgang, uh, you know, for your, your support here as well. And probably most importantly, Diana Ren Rapp, uh, who has really, um, been the glue that puts this together and has, has really done this work. So I'd like to ask everybody to join me in a round of applause and, and thanks. Uh, for, for this. Thank you very Thank much. You.
And, and just, um, you know, the, the sort of last thing I want to leave you with is just to, to sort of think about, you know, the ways that from the remarks today, from the conversation today, how we can kind of pull this into our work, into what we do as, as students, as educators, as researchers, um, wherever that's relevant, and are there things that we can be doing and want to be doing to build on this sort of, you know, the, the strong track record, the long history of relationships between the U.S. and Brazil, taking advantage of, of our, our location here in Atlanta as a global city and really building on that, and then leveraging the resources between our collaborations at Georgia State and Georgia Tech through the, uh, you know, uh, work in the global studies space. Um, so th those are things to sort of take away. And again, thanks everyone for being here. It means the world to us, especially uh, being back in person at, at events. So um, thank you all. Appreciate it.